We've been in this sermon series now for a few weeks. This is installment five, so if this is like your first Sunday here, it's okay. It should make perfect sense. You missed the first four. It's all right. Uh, We're going through the book of Ephesians chapter by chapter to talk about the power of God's love for us, how Paul saw it as Jesus dying on the cross not just changes everything about our eternity, it changes everything about how we are to live here and now, that we have a purpose to live out that God's given us and he's equipped us with all sorts of different gifts and personality and likes and dislikes and being the people that we are he puts us into position so that we can live the kingdom of God for other people to see and this is where we are as uh, we're going through the book of Ephesians the power of love which by the way next week's the week I'm told You come a little early, you're going to hear the band's rendition of The Power of Love by Huey Lewis in the news, okay? With one edited line, because it's not appropriate for church, but, and I didn't even, I just thought that song was fun. I had no idea, and Dan showed me the lyric, I'm like, ooh, yeah. Just a little rewrite. Uh, Sorry, Huey. But uh, anyway, as we get into this, we were talking about how Paul believed in the first couple of chapters, the real big concept here is this idea of the mystery of God. That God had a plan from before the earth was formed. That just like we've been joking around, just like Scooby-Doo episodes at the end, it's like Jesus on the cross is unmasked for who he really is. He's not just a carpenter from Nazareth. He is God himself, God incarnate. And his plan was to forgive us all by his power on the cross. And we access that forgiveness by faith. He said the mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and sharers together in the promise in Christ Jesus. The first three chapters of Ephesians was Paul talking about what to believe. They're doctrinal. This is how we properly believe about Jesus and what he did on the cross. And then the second half of Ephesians is all ethical, how to behave. In other words, what we believe should have an impact on how we live our lives. But the big point that he makes is that it's kind of the opposite of what the Jewish Jewish Christians in that church in Ephesus would have understood. Their idea was, well, if we follow the law, that makes us good enough so God will accept us. And what Paul is saying, no, 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 it's not, you have it backwards. You're accepted because of what he did on the cross. He loves you. Therefore, he accepts you. But your behavior still matters it still is a reflection of what you say you believe. We all do this all the time, right? I mean, none of you, but people say one thing and do another. We believe uh, in something, but our actions don't always line up. Well, Paul says, hey, look, and this is what he said in Ephesians 4.1, as a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you, and and that wasn't metaphorical. He was literally in prison for uh, teaching about Jesus. I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. And he continues this idea in chapter 5, which is where we pick it up. He says, be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved children. Imitators of God. Do what God does. Well, how do I know what God does? How do I know God? How does anybody know God? Because he made himself known. Jesus came to live a life in the human plain so that we could see exactly what God is like and how he would live and how he would love and serve. So we're supposed to be imitators of Christ. And he says, and walk in the way of love. Walk in the way of the love. Yes, from DNC, Aerosmith. Walk this way. Walk in the way of love. Don't just believe in the way of love or agree with the way of love or applaud as other people walk the way of love. All of us, as dearly loved children, walk the way of love. I feel like if Christians, if we all just heard that message and applied it, we'd have a different world on our hands. Walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Last week, I shared this illustration that I really love uh, from Tim Keller about diamonds against the black felt. You go to the jewelry store, and they, they bust out the diamonds. They put in the lighting's perfect, right? And it's so brilliant and sparkly. It'll never look that brilliant and sparkly again. It looks amazing in that moment. 
The idea is that it's the same thing with the Christian life. The beauty of the Christian faith should stand in greater brilliance against the backdrop of a sinful world. But the problem is what happens is, is our lives start to look a lot like the black felt. And they just kind of blend in. And people don't see Christians and think, oh man, that's, they're living a different way of life. They're on another level of love and sacrifice and service and faith and joy. Sadly, for most people, they look at Christians and they just say, like, man, they're, they're hypocrites. In fact, a study uh, that came out by Barna said that the number one reason that people of no faith don't believe in Christianity is because of the hypocrisy of Christians. 42% of that category said that. that. That's the reason that they don't believe. And it's hard for us, right? Because we know we're all hypocrites on some level. We're forgiven. We're not perfect. But therefore, we should be moving forward with other people in our lives with great humility. If God saved a wretch like me, I shouldn't be judging everybody else. So Paul's ethical imperative is this. If you believe it, you need to do it. Okay. So how do you do it? That's this next part of chapter 5. So here we pick it up with verse 3. He says, but among you, there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality. <laughs> it's like, yeah, this is the fun stuff to talk about at church, right? It's the first thing on the list, and not for nothing, that seems to be a big one today. Like, what do clergy all, like, go to jail for, or get in trouble for, or why are ministries de destroyed because of sexual immorality? It's like, that's the first thing he lists, and that's the big thing that, it's like the first one to to be offended, right? <laughs> it's the first offense. Must not have a hint of it. Why? Because that stuff drives people away from church. And rightfully so. It's like, oh, you know, church, they just want my money. And they're all just a bunch of hypocrites. Pastors get in a Gulfstream jet. Mine's on, it's on pre-order. And they're all like engaging in sinful behavior. Like, what the heck? They're not living a different life. I don't see the brilliance of the Christian life shining through them. So why bother? It's all a sham. I get it. There must not even be a hint. Or, or and you know, if, if you think you're off the hook. Or any kind of impurity. Or of greed. Because these are improper for God's holy people. He continues. No, this one's going to hurt a little. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. It's like, you used to live this life. But you see what I mean? If you were to read this, you would think, well, maybe, well, wait a second. I thought by grace we're saved. And then he's saying we got to do this, this, this. Remember, he's not saying, like, in order to be right with God, in order to, for salvation, in order to go to heaven one day, you do not have to be perfect. It's actually not your behavior that gets you there. It's Christ's behavior on the cross that is given to you. You are credited. It's credited to you as righteousness. But your behavior still matters for living the purpose and the plan that God has put you on this earth to do. To shine against the backdrop of the sin-broken world so that others will see your light and want it. Because for whatever reason, I'll never understand that this side of heaven, we're all God's plan A for the world. We're God's plan for sharing his love with people who don't know him. Us. I got questions, man. But this was God's plan. He continues, and I'll unpack this a little. He says, For of this you can be sure, no immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a person as an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. It's like, well, wait a second. So you're saying, like, my inheritance that you just promised me in the first three chapters is gone? No. He's making a point here. He's saying, if somebody looked at your life and saw idolater, they would not know that you follow Jesus. Like, that's what people who don't know God do. You're not that anymore. So stop living that way. Stop living that way. 
Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore, do not be partners with them. That's an interesting idea. You know where I see this happen a lot just practically is in business relationships where people, they, have, they get into business and they kind of choose a wrong partner. Somebody who isn't thinking in terms of, hey, let's do right by as many as we can while we make a profit and everybody wins. Like, and, and then there's tension that happens. And it usually doesn't end well. And I feel like Paul kind of calls it. He's not just talking about business, but he calls it, do not be partners in that way. You have fr- be friends with everybody. Have relationships with everybody. But so far as it is sort of an important thing in your life, be careful who you're partnering up with. For, and here's the punchline, right? For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. So live as children of light. For the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. It is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible, and everything that is illuminated becomes a light. Now, of course, what he's playing with is this huge biblical idea where God is described as light all the time. First John talks about this very directly. So this is the message that we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. And the idea is that God is purity. He is not tainted by sin. He is light. And he's described that way throughout the New Testament. And the idea is that if, if we're to walk in the light, we're to be imitators of God. You were once darkness, but now you are light. So find out what pleases the Lord. And I, you know, I just remember my own growth as a Christian. Become a Christian 19 years old. You've all heard my story. I go back to my college, to my fraternity. But they're all expecting a very different version of me than what I'd become. And I did all right for the first couple of months. And then we got kind of close to the end of the first semester. And I just started falling back into a lot of the same behavior that I was doing before. By the time we got into the winter... If you were to look at me from the outside, you would say that my life looked pretty indistinguishable from what it did before. And, it, and, oh, and by the way, I was like breaking on the inside because of it. I hated myself. And it was then, and some of you know this one, it was then, it was right in the middle of fraternity party, that the camp directors where I had become a Christian and had worked on staff gave me a call and they said, hey, do you want to come back to camp again this year? But you know what that did? It motivated me. I said, I want to be that old person I was. I hated that version of me. Why did I fall back into that? I was once darkness. I'm in the light now. I don't need to feel like I got to be that person I used to be. And I know none of us execute that stuff perfectly. It's a constant battle. But I'm reminded that when I'm walking in the light, the way that God wants me to, my life is better. It doesn't, my life isn't easier, but my life is better. I have more joy. I have more peace. I have more faith. I have more confidence that God's got me, that I'm going in the direction he wants me to go. Find out what pleases the Lord. Because everything illuminated becomes a light. I love that phrase. Everything illuminated becomes a light. This light that we carry as Christians does not come from ourselves. It's a reflected light. We are illuminated by Christ, and therefore we become a light to others. It's Christ's light shining through us. And I think most of the time we think our light individually just isn't much. Like, Lord, really, you picked me? I remember at the same camp, uh, we were trying to do this powerful prayer experience with the kids. And they're like, well, what if we took a cross and we... Did, made little holes in it, put tea lights in, the kids could pray and they could put their light in and we'll put it out on the lake and we'll all have this worship time. It's going to be awesome, right? T- teaching kids about the light of Christ. They're like, yeah, yeah. Like, well, who's, we don't have a cross like this, so who's going to make that? And, and they pointed at me. One thing you need to know about me, I am not technically handy at anything. 
I'm really good at calling up or emailing a service to come and fix what's, what's broken. So anyway, they're just like, it was either me making this cross or we weren't going to do it. So it took me all day because I didn't know what I was doing. And I made the little holes in the cross. And, and I lit one just sort of to test it out. And I put it in there. And I set it down on the ground. And I'm just like, this is really underwhelming. I think I made the cross too big. I don't think this is going to really do much. This is going to be a real bummer, but it's too late now. It's the only one we have. We got the kids together. We're getting ready. It's at night. We get them all to light their tea lights, and they all put their lights on the cross. And we were all absolutely thrilled. The amount of light that seemed like nothing was just beaming from this cross. And it made me remember that I'm not walking in the light all by myself. Because the lights that we think we have are pretty puny, right? We think we're not shining all that great of a light. But together, we have a transformed world on our hands. And that's just the thing. God doesn't call us to go hide away from the darkness. All right, everybody, have your own Christian community and never interact with anybody. No, we're called to carry the light of Christ into the darkness. And when we do it together... When we love the way Jesus called us to love, communities, neighborhoods, counties, states, nations are changed. Be very careful then how you live. Not as unwise, but as wise. Do you get what what he's doing here? He's not saying that you better behave or else. No, he's saying... You better let your behavior shine the light of Christ. This is your whole purpose for being here. There are people counting on you to be the person God called you to be today. You have no idea how each interaction of what seemed like throwaway events in your life, nothing you would write about in a diary, have a profound impact on the people around you. There's actually a book, I was listening to a podcast, had some driving time this week, listened to a podcast that was talking about this book that came out about near-death experiences, and the author was talking, yeah, he's, he's a former pastor, and has been working on this subject for a while now, I think it might be his third book on it, and he started talking about how an, the things that all these near-death experiences have in common, and people's experience of interacting uh, with God, or, or sort of how that goes, and one thing, it, a lot of people had this experience of a life review. And what they were expecting was that it would be judgmental, that they would feel judgment for the things that they didn't do right in their life. But it was the opposite. When they went through their life review, it's like God was revealing how the people who were receiving the the things that they did, how they were really responding to it on the inside, how, how they were touching people they had no idea they were touching with love, with life, with the light of Christ, because they didn't know their story. You never know. When you leave here and go to Sickles, which is really our fourth service at Tower Hill. (laughs) I see everybody there. I don't always go out to church like, oh, hey, Pastor, you know. Um, (laughs) Number 304. Uh, Some of you resonate with that. But, you know, as we go out there, it's like you have no idea how you are living, the kind of love you are showing. The kind of kindness, your extent, you have no idea what that's doing for the person across from you. Make the most of every opportunity, right? Make the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. And again, God, the whole point is God doesn't want us to run from darkness, but bring light to darkness. And I always like sharing examples of people who are doing that. You know, I know Hollywood gets a bad rap, and there's certainly a lot of darkness there, just like everywhere else. But it's not all darkness. There are some Christians who have infiltrated, or who have used their platform to help bring light into the darkness. I want to share a couple couple stories real quick. I had fun running some of these stories down. The first one I've known about for years, but it's always the most surprising for many, is Alice Cooper. Yep, that Alice Cooper is a Christian. Alice Cooper uh, says that becoming a devout Christian saved him from addiction. 
This was from Relevant Magazine. He said, my wife and I are both Christian. My father was a pastor. My grandfather was an evangelist. I grew up in church, went as far away as I could from it, almost died, and then came back to the church. When asked about his kind of wild stage shows, which he still does, he said the following. He said, there's nothing in Christianity that says I can't be a rock star. People have a very warped view of Christianity. They think it's all very precise and we never do wrong and we're praying all day and we're right wing. It has nothing to do with that. Go Alice. I know it's not his real name, but... He's trying to bring light to the darkness around him in his way. And I applaud that because these celebrities, they say anything about Jesus and it's like they get beat up, they get pummeled or discredited. Some of you are fans of the Amazon Prime show Reacher. Uh, that's, that's not a Christian show. I'm just, you got to know, when I say things up here, it doesn't mean, hey, go watch them. They're going to help you grow closer to Jesus. That's not... This isn't that. But I will say, the main character, the main actor, is a very strong Christian. I've seen him on some interviews. So Alan Richson, he said, uh, again, this was, this was also Relevant Magazine, Reacher star Alan Richson wants more faith-based films. Here's what he said. The fact that people are hearing the name of Christ in movie theaters is a powerful thing. And if that's where the pulpit is for people who wouldn't normally step foot in the church then that's still a great way to have that conversation. It matters that these films get supported. I love it. And then you've probably all seen this guy in action, Deion Sanders, man. What a, what a story this year. Wild ride for him. But here's what he says about his faith. He says, I don't believe you can be at your optimum without your faith. Sports is sports. It's a game. My faith is everything. It's the gas that propels the courage. The truth it keeps me going. It's the wind. It's the wings. It's the air that pumps into my lungs that provokes me to live. Faith is everything. But here's my favorite story. This is from last year, last spring. The Oklahoma champions, national champions for softball. When they had their opportunity in an interview, here's what they said. This was amazing. A lot of you, I, I actually, a lot of you shared the video with me because you also were touched by what they said. Here's what they said. I think a huge thing that we've really just latched on to is eyes up, and you guys see us doing this and pointing out, but we're really like fixing our eyes on Christ, utility player Alyssa Brito said. They continue, thankfully, we've had a lot of success this year, but if it was the other way around, joy from the Lord is the only thing that can keep you embracing those memories, moments, friendships, Grace Lyons, who's an infielder, said during the press conference, and one more. We worked our butts off to be here, Jada Coleman, another utility said. We want to win, but it's not the end of the world because our life is in Christ and that's all that matters. Bringing light to the darkness. What kind of platform has God given you to use? You know, I'm not a celebrity. Good, then you don't have as much at risk. What platform has God given you in your life? To share your faith. Doesn't mean you got to preach at people. That does not work. How do you live in such a way that the brilliance of the Christian life is shining against the backdrop of a sin-broken world? I was thinking about what this means to make the most of every opportunity. That's really what it's about. I had a friend. He was an ex-youth group kid. His name's Alan. I don't know if you're familiar with uh, death metal. You familiar with this? Or at least you know it exists. So it's basically imagine like the hardest heavy metal with just unintelligible grunting. Gr oh, no, well, grunt screaming. I mean, it's not my jam. I, a lot of people like it. It's, it's, it's not my thing. But Alan liked it, and he thought to himself, he goes to these shows, and all these kids are you know, angry, and there's a lot of darkness there. He goes, I want to bring light to that. So he put together, it's ridiculous sounding, a Christian death metal band. <laughs> and he went and played these shows and all the lyrics about their relationship with Jesus. For him, that's what it looked like to bring light 
into the darkness. What does it look like for you? We're about to have Thanksgiving pretty soon. You're going to see some family. Maybe not all of them are on the same page with faith. And you're gearing yourself up for an argument. Don't take the bait, man. Don't do it. That's what they want. (laughs) Would you like another slice of pie, Uncle Fred? Let me do that for you. Right? How do I bring the light of Christ to that even? It sounds silly, but that's where it starts. To the people in our family, to the people in our friend group. Paul's ethical imperative. If you believe it, you need to do it. Which is the original purpose of the law anyway. It's like, it used to be like, well, you adhere to the law, and then that's what saves you. Not true. God's grace saves you. But you still have to respect the guardrails that God put on this life. That behavior does matter. It shows what we really believe. And this should be reflected in our everyday lives. Okay, and then the last part of chapter 5 is is really interesting and have been taking, it may be the part that's been taken most out of context in the Bible. I know that's saying something. You'll see why. So this last part of chapter 5 is all about what's known as the household codes, as scholars call it. That walking in the light begins in the home. But... There often have been misunderstandings about this. And these scriptures have been used to abuse and condone the subjugation of women and slavery. And when people say things like, well, the Bible condones slavery, they often point to these passages. But, but I'm about to tell you, like, it's because it's misinterpreted. And I'll explain why. What Paul's trying to do is he's trying to say, this is how you bring light to the darkness in the way households are run. He's trying to show what a difference the cross makes just in our family relationships. So the households back in Paul's time reflect Aristotelian thinking, which is that the institution of slavery and domination of men over women ensures a properly functioning household. That's just what they believe. So it's pretty hard to sort of to ding Paul on talking about slavery and the roles of men and women, and it's pretty hard to say, well, you're, you just believe in slavery, or you believe that you know, men should have power over women, and all of that. That's not the case. He's trying to explain in a different way how the light of Christ should change those relationships. Because back in his day, slaves and women and children were considered property of the head of household, which is the darkness of Paul's culture. But I don't believe... And I think scripture bears out, Paul doesn't think this is what Christ wants. For example, what he says in Galatians 3.28, there is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. He's bringing this radical equality into the culture at the time. When we read it, maybe we don't think initially radical equality that he's saying. But watch how this shows out here. He starts off by saying, in your relationships, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. This would have been radical to say. What do you mean submit to one another? I'm the head of the house. I'd submit to no one. Submit to one another. Verse 22, he says, Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. That, they would have expected that. They're like, yep, and that's... But they would expect him to stop right there. He continues, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Love your wives like Christ loved you and saved you. Love your wives like that. What? Radical. But when we read it first pass, we might not think so radical. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For this reason, 
A man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. Now watch this. This is a profound mystery. There's that word again. Same word in the Greek as what we looked at in chapters 1 through 3 about the mystery of what Christ did, the gospel of Jesus. This is a mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. So what he's saying is, the closest human relationship we have to Jesus' relationship with us is marriage. Where two mysteriously become one. They are joined together. And that our marriages should reflect the kind of love Jesus has for his church. Radical, right? But we get a little lost in, in the ancient culture sometimes. But his whole point is, it should change how we live our lives just in our families, in our own house. The love of Christ should cause us to treat one another differently. We're going to, take, we're going to go a little bit into the beginning of chapter 6, because he's really continuing the idea. Watch what he says next. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Everybody knows that. But, fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. And here's what he says about slaves. It totally gets taken out of context. Slaves, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear and with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. He, he, I'm telling you, he's trying to bring Christ to even the institution of slavery. He's trying to bring the light into the darkness. We all abhor slavery. We reject it outright, as we should. But understand, Paul's not just like condoning slavery here. He's trying to speak the light of Christ into it as best he could at the time, when that was the norm of the ancient world. But watch what he says next. And masters, treat your slaves in the same way. Do not threaten them, since you know that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven. Paul is trying to bring light to a darkened culture. The work of Jesus on the cross for him, changes everything. So the question is, how do we do this for our culture? How do we do it in our world, in our lives? I think it's back to what he said. We make the most of every opportunity by becoming imitators of God. And I think it works kind of like in concentric circles. I think it starts with the light of Christ in us. It starts in us. We can't be imitators of God if we don't know God. A couple of years ago on my birthday, the staff thought it would be pretty funny to imitate me. They all wore their plaid shirts. And it was funny because they know me. They could imitate me. My mannerisms, whatever. It's the same way with God. We're supposed to be imitators of God. You've got to know God. Get into a devotional. Get into the Bible. Get into praying. Get into a small group. Do whatever you can to help get to know God so you could be an imitator of God. And then it extends to our family, our work, our friends, and everyone around us. Again, we can't imitate what we don't know. God doesn't remove us from culture. He illuminates us in it so we can bring the light. I think this is why Jesus even tells us, he says, you are the light of the world. It's not your own light. I'm providing the light. And if you're illumined by me, you become a light to everyone around you. That, as Paul sees it, as I see it, and as I think every Christian should, should see it, that is the power of love. Amen.